How do you describe homesickness to a child? You don't. They know. Children know the feeling of being away from home. It's fear, dipped in loneliness. That, what if I've been forgotten, sonnet? Or the, what if I can't go back, refrain? Even a healthy, well-scrubbed, clean, showered with love, child knows the longing of home. But if I had to, if I had to describe the aching feeling, I would say homesickness is when longing and grief wrap themselves around you like a blanket. It's the door to comfort thrown open. It's an eye on the horizon for what could be, and the only way out is to keep walking, to keep dreaming, to keep looking for the signs that will point you back home. And if you tell that to a child, you just may realize that a part of your spirit has shoes on and has always been walking, always been dreaming, always been looking for the home that could be. The door to comfort has been blown open. Tell God, I'm homesick. I'm on my way. Good morning, church. God is good all the time. Amen. Friends, welcome to worship on this first Sunday of Advent. Welcome you who are in the sanctuary. Welcome you who are worshiping at home or streaming in other places or later online. It is a good day to be together and worship as we enter into this season of, of waiting. And so as you're still standing and as you're at home, we invite you to find a stranger, to find a friend, and to share the peace of Christ with one another.
from all the places that we may be, join me in prayer. Can one be homesick for something you've never known? We are homesick for a just world, for peace like rivers, for the end of suffering. Yes, we are homesick. For joy that is contagious, for nations that feel like neighbors, for hospitals that run empty, and for freedom from gun violence. We are homesick for the world God promises. We are homesick, but we are on our way. God is here. God is still creating. We hope for a world where all are fed. We hope for a world with more bridges than walls. We hope for a world with wide open doors. We hope for a world with contagious laughter. We hope for a world where trees grow tall and creeks run clean. We hope for a world where all people feel at home, in their bodies, in the church, in their physical homes. We hope for that world. We long for that world. We are homesick for that world. So today we light the candle of hope because hope keeps our hearts alive as we wait. May this light be a reminder that the wait is always worth it. We are close to home. May we carry hope with us. When you are a child and you get homesick at a sleepover or at summer camp, you call home and your parents come and get you. Sometimes that's what love looks like. Love bails us out. In the same way, when we call upon God to confess that we've messed up or forgotten something or overlooked the truth, God answers with grace. God answers with love. So let us, together today, confess, knowing that nothing could keep God from loving us. Gracious God, we find ourselves with two options every day, to stay homesick for the world you had in mind, or to allow cynicism to win. Do we hope against hope, or do we throw in the towel? Do we insist on a better world, or do we assume it's impossible? Forgive us for the days when cynicism wins. Forgive us for numbing our homesick hurt instead of using it to fuel a better world. Kindle in us a hope 
and the peace of Christ that won't let go. Gratefully we pray. Family of faith, even when we throw in the towel, even when we give up on hope, God does not give up on us. We are loved. We are claimed. We are invited closer to God's home. So hear and trust this good news. There is room for us in God's house, and nothing can separate us from that love. We are claimed. We are forgiven. We are welcomed home. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please join me in prayer. God of the stars and God of our hearts, our days will pass, but your words will last. The earth might fade, but your words will last. Our memories might blur, but your words will last. The grass will wither, but your words will last. The sky could go dark, and your words would last. So as we listen today, help us hold on to what will last. Help us hold on to you. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. Please rise and body your spirit for the reading of the gospel. I'll be reading from Luke chapter 21 verses 25 through 36. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth, distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the earth will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory, now, when these things begin to take place, stand up, raise your heads, because redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourself and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life, and that day does not catch you unexpectedly. Like a trap, for it will come upon all who live in the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. This is what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
And now I invite the children to come forward for a time for the child within us all. Before we go up to godly play, we can all come up on the steps. Good morning. It's great to see you all today. I hope you all had a really great Thanksgiving holiday. And there's lots of room on the steps. Anywhere is good. That's good. Um, and this is the first Sunday in Advent. So the church was all decorated for that we could celebrate Advent. For children's time during Advent, I'm going to ask you guys wondering questions, which are a lot like the questions we ask after we tell a godly play story, we tell a Bible story, and then we wonder about what was the meaning of that story from God. So we're just, God bless you, we're just going to ask wondering questions. So I'm going to say a, a wondering statement, and then we'll just wonder about it for a little bit. I wonder what you do when you miss someone. I wonder if you've ever missed your home. I wonder what it feels like to have to leave your home. Have you ever been away from home and you've just missed it and you've wanted to go back to home? When you went to Florida, you missed being at home? Yeah. So we've all felt that, right, when we've left home for a few days, or even maybe we've had to leave our parents or guardians for a few days, and we really miss them. They left you for one day and were back in the morning. But I bet you missed them at night, huh? Yep. Oh, you were asleep, so you didn't miss them? That's awesome. That's good. Good for you. Um, so the good news is that God is always with us, even when we're away from home, even when we miss the people we love. We can wait with hope for the day that we get to see them again. And while we're away from the people we love or away from our home, we can pray that God will keep our home safe and that God will keep those we love safe and keep their hearts strong. So please say this. Repeat after me. Pray with me. So let's Fold our hands and bow our heads and repeat every line after me. Loving God, we pray for those we love who are far away from us. We pray for those who miss their home. Keep them safe. Amen. Okay. Now let's stand up so we can bless all the children in the sanctuary here with us today and then all the children that are at home in their houses. So congregation, please say these words with me. May God bless you and be with you. God loves you. So do we. Amen. Time we preach. I just, just, you know, just, am I on? I don't know. No? Am I now? <laughs> the light's on. Okay. There we go. I think we should pray. Spirit of God, come and grow our faith, deepen our hope, strengthen our love, and water within each of us a greater desire to be in relationship with each other and with you so that we all might be your faithful friends. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to begin with a story. 
Uh, it's a true story, but like all good true stories, as Marilyn Robinson writes in her novel Gilead, it is best told exaggerated. You could also say that it's a story that, while it may be factually blurry, it is a true story. But sometimes that line between fact and truth is, you know, blurry. It's also going to be a particularly fun story to tell today because it's a story about my dad, who, by the way, is in the front row, and I didn't mention to him that I was telling this story today. But he knows the story. It happened in Rochester, Indiana, at Christmas time, and we're going to say 1958. Okay? Dad was 10 years old that year. And for Christmas, there was nothing he wanted more than the black cast iron Lionel electric steam engine train set. They had one on display in the front window of the local downtown hardware store, taunting him when nearly every day he would walk by. It was winding around the tree with the mountains in the background and the snow and the whole village, right? You know the scene. And sometimes he would just walk slowly by, longing. Sometimes he would plaster his little face against the window and longing. And yet, whenever he suggested that that was what he wanted for Christmas, mom and dad would say something like, that's too much money, or you won't take care of it, or you don't have time for that. But he got it in his mind that he was going to convince them that this was the present to get that year for Christmas. And so he went to work, stashing newspaper, magazine, clippings of the train in convenient places, like the front seat of his father's truck, and on the nightstand with his mother's books, and in the bathroom amongst the other stacks of magazines always conveniently open to the right page. And everywhere they were, there was a clipping of the train there for them to see. So then Christmas morning came, up early, snow on the ground, fly downstairs to the living room, to the tree, to the presents, tearing through the near sock, new socks, and all of the other useless things. Longing, hoping, looking for the train set. And finally, his father showed him one last open gift, which was, you guessed it, the train set. And before he could hardly get the paper ripped off of the box, mom told everyone to go get cleaned up. They were heading up the hill to grandma's house for the rest of the day. She lived just up the hill. You could look out the big picture window in their living room in front of the Christmas tree, up the hill into grandma's dining room through her big picture window. The new train. You can come back tonight. It'll still be here. And so they got their baths, they put on their good clothes, they went up the hill to Grandma's house while the train sat in the unopened box by the tree. They visited, they helped get the meal ready, they set the table. Finally, it was time for dinner. But my grandfather, John, and Dad's uncle, John, were nowhere to be found. And so everyone went looking for John and John. Confusing, I know, there's a lot of Johns in this family. They looked all over the house. They looked out in the barn. Not only was this delaying dinner, but it was delaying the time when Dad would get to go back down the hill home to play with the brand new train set. And for lack of anything else to do, he sat down at the dining room table and looked longingly out the window, down the hill, through the window of his home living room, at the tree. And when he looked, he could not believe his eyes because he found his father and his uncle on the floor, at the tree, playing with his brand new black cast iron electric train sets. True story, mostly. It's the beginning of Advent. And if you could look through the window of your deepest longings, what would you see? Of course, we're talking about more than presents under a tree by now. But do you know that space between now and what you were longing for? In Christian terms, do you know that space between our current reality, the way things are, and the way God intends for them to be? That space between injustice and brokenness? I don't mean to say that there's nothing hopeful or good about now, but I am talking about that space between mass shootings and weapons being transformed into plowshares. I'm talking about that space where the earth groans between global warming and the earth's full restoration. 
I'm talking about that space between now and when everyone has an actual equitable shot at getting Taylor Swift tickets for, wait a minute, sorry, that wasn't supposed to be in there. I thought I edited that part out. Advent is the space between. For the next four weeks, For the next four weeks, between this moment and Christmas morning, we are invited into the ancient Christian practice of waiting in the midst of the darkest season for the light that brings life to the world. We mark the waiting with purple, the color of lead to signify prayer and repentance for the stuff of earth, making room in our hearts for the birth of Christ. We light a new candle each week to watch the light grow, A candle of hope, a candle of love, a candle of joy, uniquely pink, so we can see the joy just pop. And finally, the candle of peace. All the while, the newness of Christ, the restoration and the redemption of all things is on the horizon. The world moves at lightning speed this time of year, pressuring us to consume, to spend, to never turn off the lights, to travel, to fill our bellies, to party on New Year's Eve, and then quickly shift back to normal on Monday morning as if everything is just suddenly over. But Advent's an alternative. It's an alternative time. It's an alternative posture. It's a practice of turning our attention to the truth that there is more beyond what we can see. And it begins today. Today is like New Year's Day. On the Christian calendar, this day begins the first, this day, this first Sunday of Advent is the beginning of the new Christian year. The year that ended last week when we celebrated the reign of Christ. The mere acknowledgement of the Christian year is a subversive act. It's an act of resistance to a consumer-driven culture, to a world in which the strongest, the wealthiest, the most privileged reign. It begins by investing our hopes in the Christ child who would die for suffering love and it ends proclaiming the reign of the one who did die and resurrected. All other sources of authority and domination take a back seat. All of those other sources have so much influence and control and say in our lives, but they do not shape our identities and our communities the way a Christ-formed community does. And so the practice of Advent sets us on on an alternative time. It's a kind of slow time We rest hopeful and watchful in the dark, lighting the simplest of candles one at a time in the space between Earth's groaning and our deepest longings for the world's redemption. And then on Christmas morning, we turn on all of the lights for 12 whole days. For 12 days, we celebrate Christmas, the birth of Christ, the things that we've been waiting for, but for now, we're only at the beginning. The birth is on the horizon, the distant horizon. The wounds of the past year are still fresh. And so we enter the in-between, looking through the front window with a kind of homesickness for our deepest longings, hoping that they will come bundled up in the newborn Christ child. And so I don't know about you, but every time of, when this time of year rolls around, I look forward to those gospel stories that point towards Jesus' birth. I look forward to Isaiah's nod to the child who will lead us, to the shoot from Jesse's tree, to the angel tapping Mary on the shoulder and coming to Joseph in a dream, to John leaping in his mother's womb with Mary pregnant as Jesus enters the room. I long for the light that shines in the darkness. And yet these first weeks of Advent, the lectionary always begins with gospel readings where the hope is less evident and the, and the playfulness is nearly non-existent. And today, before we hear John in the wilderness, before the census draws the Holy Family to Bethlehem, we're given damning words from a Jesus who is only days from his crucifixion. He's standing in the temple telling of a time when that very temple, that center of all religious and political life, will be destroyed, which it was in 70 AD, about 40 years later. For several days, Jesus had been preaching in that temple. And with each new day, the religious authorities were growing increasingly angry, plotting how they would kill him for fear of the growing number of people who were gathering around him and listening to him. It all began just a few days prior when Jesus rode into Jerusalem and then went into the, table and flipped over, went into the temple and flipped over all of the tables and accused the money changers of turning his father's house into a den of robbers. And then he told a parable about a vineyard owner and some tenants left in charge while the, The vineyard owner went away for a time to another country, and one by one, the owner sent servants to the tenants, 
but they killed them. And then the vineyard owner sent his son, thinking, surely they will respect him. But no, they killed the son too. The people who are listening are charged up. The religious authorities are angry because they feel this is a parable told about them and against them. An accusation that they don't recognize the Son of God and choose to protect their own power rather than yield to God's messengers. And then at one point, Jesus pauses and he notices this poor widow in the temple. She's giving everything that she has to live on to the temple. And then he notices wealthy people also giving. And the difference, he points out, is that she has given from her poverty and they from their abundance. We like to lift up the poor widow as an exemplar of generosity, but that's missing the point. Just moments before, Jesus condemned the scribes for devouring widows' homes while they sat in places of honor. The woman was not a generous giver. She was caught in a culture exploiting her for all she had in the name of religion. Her gift to the temple could have brought bread to her table. This is not to say that Christians are not called to extravagant generosity and to give abundantly to God's work in the world through the church, your welcome stewardship team. It's just to say that this text isn't the foundation of that. Jesus exposed a way in which the institution that intended to give life to people was in fact draining their lives and exploiting them. This is the moment Jesus begins to speak of the unspeakable, how the beloved temple is actually going to come down soon. It will be surrounded by oppressive armies. It will be destroyed. People will be taken away. Lives will be ruined. And then these words from our text this morning, it's going to feel like the world is ending. But hold tight because what feels like the end is actually the dawning of the kingdom of God. As when leaves from a tree, as when the leaves of a tree emerge from the buds, Alert us to summer's nearness. Creation's violence and suffering indicates the nearness of God's kingdom. The stuff of earth, the things that we cling to might pass away, but Jesus' words will remain. And so guard your hearts. Don't we be weighed down by worry. Don't be crushed by the weight of it all. Be alert. Pay attention. Pray for strength. Light a candle. Practice Advent. Invest your hopes in that space where your deepest longings and the promises of God collide. Upon the first reading, Jesus' words are easy to write off, as if too detached from us. But while the context is foreign to our 21st century experience, the fear and the fragility acknowledged along with the hope promised are familiar. Have not the last three years caused confusions among the nations? Has it not seemed as though the foundations of what we know to be true have been rattled? If anything, these years of pandemic on top of senseless gun violence and racial violence, and now a war in Ukraine, all out bizarre politics, have taught us that the foundations of the institutions we once believed in and grounded us are fallible and temporary. And the full reign of God on earth is still yet to come. And yet, and yet, It's near. The promises of God are near and as true as they have ever been. Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said, but my words will never pass away. Today's liturgy speaks of a kind of homesickness, that deep down longing for a place other than where we immediately find ourselves. This is not to say that we cannot or should not be content where we are, because where God, where we are, God is. There is nowhere we can be that God is not. And yet God holds a vision for the world that we are yet to fully realize. And deep down, we know what we see around us is not God's vision. What we know is temporary, and what God holds and intends is eternal. I once heard that those moments of Scripture pointing us towards a future reality described as a standing is, is, is kind of like standing on the front porch to the kingdom of God and getting a glimpse through the front window. And what we see through the front window is what God intends. This is God's reality. This is God's intention for the world, moving ever nearer to us until one day it becomes our own. And so on this first Sunday of Advent, with the candle of hope glowing, I invite you to look through the window. What do you see? This is the hope that will come bundled up in the Christ child. 
our eyes on this hope as the practice of Advent. God of the weary and the waiting. Scripture tells us that where two or more are gathered, you are there. So we trust that you are here listening to these words, drawing us close and stirring hope. And for this, we are grateful. We are so grateful. Today, holy God, we feel close to home, close to home when the choir sings, when the candles are lit, when we enter this space and someone knows our name. We feel close to home when our children are curious and ponder the questions. When we find moments of true connection and when we are brave enough to be who you call us to be. We give thanks for the beauty of this sanctuary that's been decorated for Advent and for all the people who made it possible. We're grateful for thanksgivings that were filled with blessings. Our hearts are filled with the possibilities and hopes that lie before us in Advent. We're grateful for safe travel, for birthday blessings for a special friend. And we give thanks for a granddaughter who after a year like no other has been diagnosed as cancer free. However, God, even with the gratitude for those close-to-home moments, we also recognize that very deep within us, we do indeed have homesick hearts. And holy God, we pray that you will hear these prayers from our hearts that make us yearn and long and have us in those places of homesickness. We're homesick for a world that we have not seen. We are homesick for a world where oceans are clean and trees are green and animals are not endangered. We're homesick for a life where days feel expansive and Sabbath feels possible. We're homesick for days when mental health is not stigmatized and the time is not a commodity and self-worth is not a scarcity. God who never leaves us alone, 
We are carrying both hope and homesickness all at the same time. And so we ask you to hear these prayers for the Ugin family, for Chris, as his death draws near. We pray for his family as they surround him in love. We ask you to be with Kathleen and bring to her health and happiness. We pray for Jay Sean as he faces possible imprisonment. And we pray that indeed he may be proven innocent and released. We ask you to be with the daughter Jasmine to find you and to have the strength to get through the hard times that she's going through. And we ask for her safety for her and her family as they find housing. May your spirit abide with Tim. And God, when the news is broken into our lives time and time again, both close here in Kalamazoo and afar, when we hear about lives that have been broken and hearts that will never be the same because gun violence has happened once again. We pray, God, for all those places on earth that are indeed in distress, just as Scripture declares this morning. And we pray for all those whose thanksgivings were empty and lonely. Call us to that gift of hope, O God, and remind us that even in the midst of the homesickness, there is a small candle that burns, and its name is hope. For all these prayers, For all these convictions, we give you thanks. And we sing with an open and waiting spirit. And now, with confidence, with hearts that yearn for hope, let us pray the words that Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. As we come into our time of offering, I would remind you that we are still in the midst of a giving campaign. And if you have not yet had the opportunity to make a pledge for all of the ministries that are before us in this new year, I encourage you to do so. There are pledge cards by the welcome desk in front of the office. And you may also go online. And we've made it really easy for you to find that button to be able to give. But in this Advent season, on this first Sunday of Advent, I encourage you that all those pledges are important. But the pledge and the commitment that is most important in this Advent season is the commitment of your heart. That we open our hearts. That we give of our hearts. That we commit our hearts to that which is most important. In this time of offering, let us give.
Please join me in our prayer of dedication. Holy God, we long for the day that you spoke of when swords will be beaten into plowshares. The lion will lie down with the lamb and justice will roll like waters. Until that holy day comes, take these gifts and use them to build that world here. In hopefulness, we pray. Amen. Please remain standing just as I offer just a few reminders of our shared life that you can find in your bulletins and on the website and our social media. As ways of, to enhance our season of Advent, I hope that you will dive in to some of the Advent concerts, to the Advent class that's offered after worship with John Clark in the parlor and online. And the Advent labyrinth is laid out in the Wesley Hall below us, and you are invited to uh, walk that labyrinth after worship today or any weekday between the time of 9 and 4. And then there's also Advent concerts on Thursday at noon. And then just a little bit more, there are calendars of Advent, and there are also Advent devotionals that will go along with this worship theme all the way through Advent. Those are available at the Welcome Center, so I hope that you will pick one or some of those up, maybe even take one to a friend who, who may be in need of one as well. This is our shared life. Let us make it so. And let us sing ourselves out into this world. People of God, today we have crossed the threshold and entered into that space between, between our deepest longings and the promises of God. And so with the candle of hope lit before us, take that candle, go into the world with eyes open for God's promises are coming. And let all the people say,